This is a special presentation of Farm Journal Television. Today's farmers have high-tech equipment, from tractors to GPS to the hybrids fighting for every bushel. Here to help is agronomist Ken Ferry. There's definitely some things we put into our systems pyramid. And agronomist Missy Bauer. So we're trying to create that true V trench. And they're using the systems approach to higher yields on every acre. I'm Clinton Griffiths, and she's Margie Fisher. Together, we're Corn College TV. Corn College TV, brought to you by Micro Essentials, the next generation of fertilizer designed to meet the needs of advanced farming technology. For more information, visit microessentials.com. And by Winfield, uncovering insights through data to help farmers be greater. Visit your local retailer or learn more at winfield.com. Thanks for joining us for Corn College TV. Today we're going to be talking about fertility. And Missy, the system's approach to fertility has a lot of moving parts, but let's start with the basics. Where do we need to begin? Where we really need to start is with our soil test. So we need to have a soil test to give us an indication of where are things at out in this field. And the way we want to pull those soil tests is pretty important. So what I like to do is make sure that we're pulling them by the soil types that are out in this field. Yeah, not all soils are the same in every field, right? Correct. So what we see in this field is we've got some soils that are, are pretty dark in color. So this has pretty high organic matter, higher exchange capacity. But yet we've got areas in the fields where the soil is lighter. It's got more sand in it, lower organic matters, lower exchange capacity. So we want to make sure that we're pulling our soil tests in these different management zones that are around the field. Okay, we probably also want to be checking for P and K and out in our field and, and talk about that a little bit. So once we get the soil test pulled, we send it in the lab, it's going to give us an indication of where our phosphorus and potassium levels at. And if our phosphorus and potassium levels are low in certain parts of the field, then we need to apply maybe broadcast fertilizer to keep those levels up overall. So we want to apply uh, phosphorus, maybe MAPRDAP or potash out there to make sure the overall levels are where we want them to be in the field. What about pH? pH is also really important. That soil test is going to tell us that as well. So for corn production, we like to be in that 6.5 to 6.8 range. So we want to make sure that the pH is adequate amongst these different soil types or management zones that are out in the field. Well, let's talk starter fertilizer now. That's always a debate. It seems farmers are arguing with themselves a lot of years. Good or bad, or what do you think? Well, in general, I'm a big fan of starter fertilizer for corn production. I think it just helps us get off to a good start. So timing and placement is what it's all about. So if those roots can come into contact with fertilizer when the plants are quite small, it'll help that early growth. So if we advance that early growth, it can even advance maturity, sometimes by five to seven days. What that means is maybe I get to pollination a little sooner. I get through pollination before maybe it gets as hot in July or as hot in dry uh, conditions that we would have at that time. So anything I can do to get that plant going, I'm a pretty big fan of. Sure. Well, what about the rest of the year building a, a nitrogen program? Yeah, nitrogen is going to be critical. We want to make sure we've got enough nitrogen to get us started. That helps as far as breaking down last year's residue and what we call managing the carbon penalty. But it also comes into play late season. We want to make sure we have enough nitrogen to get us through the season to get what we call tip fill. So if we get short on nitrogen late season, we really start to have a lot of kernel abortion. It can be very detrimental as far as yield goes. Is there any way we can check that throughout the growing season? Yeah, one of the things that we can do to check that would be pulling soil nitrate samples as well as tissue tests. So if we can pull tissue tests throughout the season, it's kind of like our grade card. You know, where are we at? And maybe sometimes we can still do something about it. Otherwise, what it allows us to do is look at our overall program and say, what changes do I need to make for next year? Overall, I guess bottom line is that not all soils are the same fertility. Some are more fertile than others. Correct. So when we have a field like this, lots of variability, different management zones out there. This soil may have different levels in than this soil here, and we need to manage that as such. So we don't want to treat this whole field the same when it's not. So respect in our management zones, respect the soil types that are out there, and realize that there's difference in these fertility levels as we go across this field. Ken, I know it matters how much nitrogen you put down, and in fact, we're seeing a pretty good example of that right here, but you say it also depends on soil type and what the soils can do. Try it. So, managing nitrogen is, is one of those where you got to use all the tools in the toolbox, and, and we're using timing uh, to help us with efficiency to manage loss and making sure the nitrogens are at the right time. Um, but we also need to know how do we pick the right rate. The right rate is managing loss and then trying to come up with some type of uh, estimate of how much your soil is going to give you. And you have to make up the balance. And some of these soils are a lot more forgiving than others, and you have to put that into factor. 
Today we have different types of tests we can use to look for mineralizable in uh, or organic nitrogen release and then we can back that up with tissue and nitrate testing to follow it through. This particular block that we're in right now only has 50 pounds of nitrogen applied and it was applied in the fall so it's a high risk situation. Absolutely. Well, and you can tell the corn looks like it. It's in trouble, it's firing, it's stunted, it's about half the height. Uh, probably not going to make anything. It's severely nitrogen deficient. But uh, we also have soils within this same plot that have high mineralization rates and their ability to mineralize nitrogen uh, shows up. Plus this plot is also five years of corn on corn and as we track nitrates we can tell that there's mineralizing taking place uh, from past crops. So a situation where it's starting to pony up or you're seeing a, a rollover effect of the nitrogen itself. Sure. And We'll go take a look at the soil type with the same 50 pound radon and you won't believe what that soil type looks like under 50 pounds of nitrogen. All right, let's go take a look. Well, this end of it looks pretty good, Ken. Yeah, this is the same treatment, goes all the way through the plot. There's only 50 pounds of nitrogen applied here in the fall. And look what this corn's doing. Oh, it's green, it's growing, it's got some height to it. Yeah. And our tissue test does indicate that this is running lean on nitrogen and we're about to probably run out. As you go out in there, you'll see more firing higher up. So it's telling us that 50 pounds isn't enough, sure. but it's a tremendous difference. Now, where does that nitrogen come from? Well, in this case, our, our soil tests indicate that this particular soil type that we're in right here has a high mineralization rate, meaning the uh, conversion of organic nitrogen to ammonium to nitrate is a lot higher than that soil type there. The soil will give us more. We can test that, we can tell that, we can predict that in this situation. Now, when we uh, look at our soil test, the nitrates in the top two foot here are only about four part per million. Huh, that's pretty so low. That's pretty low. This corn should be flaming out. It should be showing trouble. But when you look at the ammonium values, and the ammonium values in this end in the top two foot are over 20 part per million. That's kind of rare to have ammonium values higher than nitrate values, and it does tell you that almost all the nitrogen this plant's feeding on is mineralizable nitrogen as organic matter is being broken down and released as ammonium, and it's being used up by the microbes and the corn crop, and not a lot has got converted to nitrate, and it's kept it in pretty good shape. Now, again, it's, it's still going to run out out there, but that's one of those big things within a, a nitrogen management program, figuring out what the soil's going to give you, accounting for the loss, then using your tools, timing and efficient, efficiency and nitrogen inhibitors and all those things to try to make sure it's there at the right time. And of course, this plot would be calling out for a variable rate nitrogen, meaning it's going to take less nitrogen right here to produce 200 bushel corn than it is on the other end. Absolutely. But this still, as you get out of here, you realize it's not perfect, but it's kind of amazing how, how much corn you can get out of 50 pounds of nitrogen. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Corn College TV, brought to you by Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Supercharge your phosphorus this fall with Avail to maximize the use of your fertilizer investment in the spring. Over the generations, Fertilizer, the unsung hero of the farm, has been in the background, quietly nourishing crops with very little fanfare. Until now. Meet the next generation of fertilizer. Micro Essentials. There are 406 million acres of cropland in the U.S. Winfield is helping to make them work harder. Maybe the answer isn't a new product, but a new way of thinking. A way to turn data into something you can harvest, driving efficiency into every molecule. It's time to rethink what a business partner can be. It's time to be greater. Winfield. You don't just see a field. You see the future of your operation. One we're helping you protect. Enlist is a new herbicide tolerant trait system that will build on glyphosate. Improving performance to move farming ahead. 
as we look at this seed, um, we can see this brown root and it's truncated right here. Uh -huh. uh, and there should, should be a radical root moving this way and another root system coming back that way. Uh, and both of these are missing. And, and that uh, is a result of the actual uh, salt content in the starter that burnt this seed. Okay salt content or the burn of the seed is always tied to soil moisture so if we have plenty of moisture we can get away with a lot if we are out of moisture then the risk factor goes up the other thing that goes up in this scenario is any damage to the seed that happens in the embryo axis so that kind of indented part of the seed if it has any type of tear in it and you put starter on the seed even if it's a low salt starter you can kill that seed now, uh, in this situation, we're dealing with a round seed, and round seed, the embryo axis tends to be more exposed. It can actually be, an in, uh, instead of being indented, it can be a bulge on the seed itself, and mechanical damage tends to um, give you some more issues there. Hmm. So, uh, any tear in that area right there, the salt can get in and it can kill that root system, or it can actually kill the germ and not bring it up. And about a third of the plants in here that are missing uh, show starter burn. So, in this case, um, too dry a soil, too high a salt load. Uh, if we went deeper with the planting into more moisture, uh, we could fix this. If we shut the starter off, we could have, could eliminate this too well. So it's it's been caught from both directions. And again, this will not put on an ear. It probably will survive, uh, and it'll be a barren plant out there in the field itself. Now this one isn't made it out of the ground yet. It's trying to leaf out underground. Uh, the tip did get nipped a little bit and it'll probably leaf out underground, but definitely if it makes it out, um, it won't put on an ear being next to this one. So if we're more than one collar behind the neighboring plant, uh, you're going to lose it. So when you're doing your stand counts out here, you have to count them as weeds, not as, as ears. And that's ears is what we got to have here to, to bring that stand in. So. Again, looking at moisture conditions on this particular field is, is uh, kind of had a, a light vertical till pass across it uh, within hours before planting. And one of the challenges you can run in there is we're filling in dips and valleys and you're only hours ahead of the planter. The soil may not uh, homogenize the moisture, meaning that we may not get the moisture to, uh, to come uh, and equalize in it. So you might be planting in dry soil and that's kind of looks like here where we went where areas where it was a little too dry, didn't fire on time and then it fired later. So some of this uh, gaps that we're looking at is just seed that didn't germinate in dry soil. Um, we'd like to have about a 48 hour window between that pass and planting and let that moisture come back up so it's, you know, it's uniform. When you're using a field cultivator or soil finisher, you're kind of mixing them all in. It's a little bit different than if you're using more of a, a vertical format. You have to make sure the water levels come back together. The starter side of that equation the same way, whether you're using a low salt starter or a regular starter, if you're putting it in the furrow and you're out of moisture, shut it off. Um, seed quality, in this case we're looking, I don't know what the actual seed quality is because no test was running, but we are looking at a round seed uh, and that carries higher risk. So it comes back to um, you know, the quality control at the seed house and what you're willing to work with. And you could have cracks in the pericarp and it's not a big issue. Uh, but when you start putting a starter on the seed, any crack in the embryo axis is going to be an issue. So you can make sure that your embryo or your severe pericarp damage is below 6%. Okay. Uh, you get above 6%, you're going to kill too many plants and it'll offset the gain that you would in the starter itself. Some things we want to think about for quality of lime is going to be looking at the purity as well as the fineness of the lime. So the purity gives us an idea of the chemical analysis and its ability to actually neutralize. The fineness goes back to how coarse or fine the actual lime is itself. So a very coarse lime, you'll see a lot of almost pebbles in here, more stone-like. The fineness part of it will be very much like a powder. So the way that we can look at that is through what we call a sieve analysis. So different sieves with different amount of mesh size that we have in here as we get into the smaller mesh size. Our overall goal with the lime would be to have a lime that we can spread so it's got a little bit of coarseness to it, but also has a fair amount of fines because this is what's really going to give us that uh, neutralizing value out in the field itself to adjust our pH in the field. 
So what we have to be cautious of, if, if our recommendation calls for a one ton of lime application, if I went and I applied one ton, is that actually equivalent to a ton out in the field? And these two samples here, there's two different examples. This lime, I'd have to apply a ton and a half to actually equal a neutralizing value of a true one ton application. The reason is there's so much coarseness in here. Compared to this sample here, if I needed a one ton, I could actually apply one ton in the field. So when I get a lot of coarseness, this doesn't break down fast enough to give me the neutralizing value I need out in the field. So look at the difference between here and here and that amount of coarseness. Now we get down to the fine part, which is going to be good neutralizing, going to be very reactive in the soil, and we have a lot more fines in this lime than we do this one here. So there is a big difference in the quality of lime. You need to understand what lime you have. You should be sending in your lime to get it analyzed at the lab, not only for sieve analysis, but also the purity, so you know how much lime your actual field should be applied. Still ahead, hybrid selection and the need for proper fertility. But up next, ground truthing through late season tissue sampling. Supercharge your pea with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer. Studies show that when you add Avail to your fall applied phosphorus, you can see an average increase of 9.9 .9 bushels of corn per acre. Avail reduces phosphorus fixation to promote more efficient pea uptake to the crop for stronger roots, better overall plant health, and higher yield. Supercharge your pea this fall with Avail Phosphorus Fertilizer Enhancer to maximize the use of your fertilizer investment in the spring. Ask your fertilizer dealer for details today. Hey, what's going on? Just checking the fields. Yours are looking pretty good. Unless you're doing something right. Actually, I got a guy. You got a guy. Well, it's not just any guy. I got a channel seedsman. Channel, yeah. Yeah, I've been working with him pretty close to get what you can see for yourself. This is what I'd recommend. Let's get to work. Now this is what you want to see. Maybe I should get a guy. Maybe you should get a channel seedsman. Find your channel seedsman at channel.com. Again, it's about mid-season, but we want to go ahead and start looking and doing some tissue sampling. Tell us about what we have here and what we're looking at. Well, we're, we're looking at <clears throat> overall plant health. So this is the same hybrid, probably on the same day. They're just rows apart, but they got two different nitrogen programs. And one nitrogen program was deficient on the front end, so that plant struggled and it was stressed. Anytime we stress a plant before harvest, we delay maturity. So this one has been stressed and we delayed the maturity compared to here. So actually we took a 112 day maturing hybrid and we make it act like 115 or later as far as how it comes in. And one thing that you can do with plant analysis is kind of dissect maybe what is the problem within this field. So in this first year we pulled tissue analysis and we did it at V6, V10 and right ahead of tasseling and we we're at optimum levels every time we sample. Where this uh, particular one over here, we sampled it the same way, and we can see that pretty much we were deficient all the way through. Right. And it's nitrogen deficiency that's driving this late maturing situation. So it could could be a lot of other things, but right now we know that if we were going to try to focus on this issue, we'd going to change the nitrogen program for that plant because it's it, whatever we're doing isn't keeping the plant happy enough through the whole season. A tissue test, and we could also add a nitrate test to this if we wanted to. Kind of gives us a snapshot of what's inside the plant and what's in the soil. So. Okay, it looks like you did three different tests or three different times you took that sample. Is that about right for uh, the way to do this? Depends a little bit on the crop and how intense you want to be. I, you know, if you're going to pick one, of course, and do it, you want to get that right coming into tasseling. You're going to grab that. Uh, you know, leaf below the ear and opposite of the ear, that's the one you're going to analyze and try to figure out, do you have enough nitrogen here? Because if you're deficient at that time, you're probably not going to finish well. And if a corn plant runs out of nitrogen early but finishes strong, it's going to suffer yield loss. But if it starts strong and runs out early, it's a lot more expensive. Right. So you don't want corn running out on the backside. Definitely. And this would be an indicator, are you going to run out on the backside? And you still probably have some time, your window is pretty close to make a change and, and add nitrogen to it. If you had a center pivot, of course this is easy. If you don't, you're back to an airplane and pray it for water. But it would give you some instruction for next year as far as how you change your nitrogen program to make sure that doesn't happen again.
don't just see a field. You see the future of your operation. One we're helping you protect. Enlist is a new herbicide tolerant trait system that will build on glyphosate. Improving performance to move farming ahead. There are 406 million acres of cropland in the U.S. Winfield is helping to make them work harder. Maybe the answer isn't a new product, but a new way of thinking. A way to turn data into something you can harvest, driving efficiency into every molecule. It's time to rethink what a business partner can be. It's time to be greater. Winfield. For this particular plot, we're trying to figure out what's the right population and what's the right nitrogen rate right. for each of these types of genetics. So we're, we're looking at uh, how those two factors play in because this particular grower uh, likes the variable rate. So he wants to variable rate his nitrogen and his population and the hybrid becomes a big part of that picture. This particular plot, we're looking at four different genetics and those genetics are split into two types, what we call a flex hybrid and a fixed hybrid, meaning a, a flexed-eared hybrid tends to flex out for population uh, or flex down, and a fixed hybrid, which has a more determinate ear, doesn't change much. And what we're actually studying in this plot is how nitrogen rates and population affect these different genetics. This particular grower wants to use variable rate planting so he wants to go in there and change population by zones and he wants to change nitrogen by zones. So we're trying to learn these hybrids to see what's it take, not only population wise, but nitrogen wise. Two ears here in the center are what the grower typically would plant. In this case, he would plant at 34,000 with this nitrogen rate. As he moves to variable rate, he wants to take populations up and down and change nitrogen rates. So this down here represents we're moving from 34,000 to 36,000 at the grower's nitrogen rate, and then we take it down 60 pounds, uh -huh. and we move it up 60 pounds. So we change the nitrogen rate out here to see what effect it would have on these ears themselves. So this is a determinant rate and change in front, a determinant hybrid, changing from 34 to 36,000. We didn't really change the ear size that much. Right. We're over here in the flex scenario. We flex them down a little bit. They change in size. But what's probably more important is when we look at the nitrogen side, when we go up in nitrogen rate, this flex hybrid tends to flex the ear up quite a bit. Oh, sure. So a situation where um, saying that this hybrid maybe needs nitrogen a little bit more than this, meaning as we flex the nitrogen up on the fixed rate, we didn't change the ears as much over here. Right. Having not enough nitrogen on, no matter what we did, um, looks like it's going to be a pretty stiff penalty. So trying to figure out uh, what to do. And in our past studies, here in Central Illinois, we've, we've seen a trend to that as well, meaning the, the flex hybrids are a little bit more sensitive to making sure you got enough nitrogen on it when you raise the population. Right. So it's not just as simple as raising the population uh, in the field and, and coming out with it. So, but it takes, a, it takes a plot like this on the farmer's own ground to, to really get a feel for it. You're kind of setting yourself up the first steps of figuring out how can I variable rate this farm? What's going to be the best option? when we try to pick a population or a nitrogen rate for it.